Hello folks, welcome back to Merrill Math. I'm Mr. Merrill. Uh, today we're going to be talking about explicit and recursive rules for linear tables. Um, and that is a whole lot of syllables to describe what is essentially a very simple idea. Um, if you're in an Algebra 2 class right now, um, these are things that you have likely seen before, but maybe have not been given this specific name. Um, so I do want to start off by taking a little bit of time to talk about the word recursive. Um, when you think about the word recursive, um, what it should, well, the prefix, it has the prefix re. When we think of re, we think of like redo, repeat. Um, so it, it, it's this action where you're doing something again. Um, in, the t in terms of this word, what you're kind of doing is you're, you're, you're looping back, and this is kind of using previous outputs to define the next output. Uh, if you're familiar with the Fibonacci sequence, uh, which hopefully you are, um, then you will be familiar with this concept of recursive rules. Uh, the Fibonacci sequence, if you're not aware, uh, is a very famous pattern, but it starts with two numbers, 0 and 1 and you get the next number by adding the previous two. So 0 and 1, 0 plus 1 is 1, 1 plus 1 is 2, 1 plus 2 is 3, and so on and so forth. Uh, it's a very fascinating pattern, a lot of really good math there, um, some interesting things going on. But we're not talking about that today, perhaps in a, another video. So explicit and recursive rules for linear tables. So we're going to start off with a very uh, straightforward table, and the first thing we have to ask ourselves is, how do we know that this table represents a linear function? Um, so in this case, uh, x is going to be our inputs. We have f of x, these are our, our, are our outputs. Um, and we have to kind of look at what is happening um, with each of these outputs. One quick and easy way to do this is to add another column to our table. Um, and you will typically see this column called delta. So the delta column, um, basically what it is describing is change. Now delta is a Greek letter, um, and that's how we read it. Um, and delta just describes change. So in the case of this table, we're looking at how do each of these outputs change. So from 11 to 14, we added 3. From 14 to 17, we added 3. From 17 to 20, we added 3. And from 20 to 23, we also added 3. This is what indicates to us that this is a linear function. If your delta is constant, if you have a constant number here, um, then that means you have a linear function. If these numbers differ at all, then it's not a linear function, it's something else. Um, so you might, in the very near future, see functions where the, the first delta is not the same, but the second delta is. Now it's not a linear function, but it is something kind of close to that. Those are what we call quadratics, or maybe the third delta. Those are cubics and quartics and quintics, and there are all sorts of uh, functions. <clears throat> that we can get from looking at these successive uh, delta columns. But for right now, we're just working with the simplest ones where the first delta column is constant. Now, another way that we can tell if this function is linear, and this is a way that is perfectly fine to rely on, is just graph them. If we graph these two points, this is an x, this is a y, so I find the point 0, 11, and then the point 1, 14, and so on and so on. If I graph this, I can tell that this is a line as well. And in fact, if I graph this and I find the slope of that line, the slope of this line is actually here. And that's going to help us in the next thing that we're doing. So the first thing we wanna do is recognize, is this linear? So that's pretty easy. We look at this delta column and we say, is it constant? If it is, then yes, it is linear. If it isn't, then no, it's something else. So the first thing is, pretty straightforward. The next thing we want to look at are these explicit rules. So an explicit rule for a line, as you might remember from uh, like your Algebra 1 days, 
we think of lines as being y equals um, mx plus b. That's a fairly common way to think about linear uh, equations, is just slope-intercept form. Now, for us, because we're dealing with functions and function notation, this is going to look a little bit different. Um, so what we're going to do, instead of thinking of this as y, we're going to think of this as f of x. Now, those say the same thing, y and f of x. They mean the same thing, but this is just a different notation. Now, depending on what your function's called, maybe this is g of x or h of x or whatever, um, this is just the name of your function. Ours happens to be f of x. That's usually what functions are. Um, but if you're dealing with multiple functions and multiple problems, you might encounter um, functions that have different names. Okay, so uh, we've got f of x, and one thing we have to find is m. m is our slope. We actually just discussed this a little bit ago. Your slope is going to be your delta term. So delta from your table is your slope. And this last piece, um, this b, is, uh, well, we're going to write it in a form that's maybe not quite as straightforward. But the way that you get this b term is most often from your table. Um, this value right here in this very specific spot, this is your b value. Your b value is the output when the input is 0. So your output here is 11, your input here is 0. Why does that work? Well, what this is doing is, if your input here is 0, so if you put 0 in for x, what has to be left over has to be this. It's going to be 11 in this case. But we will think about this in our general form, is your um, output at um, x equals 0. So when x equals 0, that is your b term. So when we're writing an explicit form of these linear functions, it's really straightforward because you can actually read both of these pieces most often off of the table. Um, sometimes you get a table that maybe starts from 1. So if this table was, it excluded this row, we would kind of have to extrapolate and say, well, if I'm counting if I'm going up and I'm counting down by 3, so 23, 20, 17, 14, what would be up here would be 11. So we have to do the output at 0. We can't just do where the table starts. Um, so in this case, our function f of x is delta, which is 3, uh, times x, plus our uh, output, when this is 0, that's going to be 11. Now, <clears throat> if we wanted to check this to make sure that it works, we can try some of these values. So you don't have to do this, but this is kind of insurance to make sure that you're right. So one way that we could check this is put in some numbers. So how about f of 3? We know what f of 3 is. It's 20. Um, so in this case, we're just going to check it and see if it's right. It should be 3 times 3, because that's your input, plus 11. So here we have 9 plus 11, which does in fact equal 20. So this works. Uh, you can try as many points as you want. Um, and the explicit form is useful. This form here is useful because let's say I want to find the 25th input. So if I want to extend the table clear down here to the 25th input, so when x is 25, find f of x, I can do that with this rule. I don't have to have the whole table built in order to get to it. Um, you do need that for the recursive rule. So the next thing we're going to talk about is the recursive rule for this table. Now the recursive rule is a little bit different. So for this, um, for this particular table, um, we'll talk about the recursive rule. So what the recursive rule says uh, we'll talk about the general form first. So the general form here is going to be f of x uh, is equal to, uh, and you sort of have this curly brace thing. Uh, here we're going to say the first output. Um, if x is equal to, and then in this case it's the first input. Um, so in 
our table, we have the first output is 11, the first input is x, or is 0, x is 0 in this case. Um, now the next piece, with the recursive rule, we sort of have to reference the previous output, so f of x minus 1, and then we have to say, well, what is it doing every time? So in this case, we're going to add our delta term if um, x is greater than our first input. Uh, whoops, st. Um, so in this case, this is sort of the general format for how we're going to deal with linear recursive rules. So it always follows this format. So for our function here, our first output, uh, let me write this down here, so f of x is, our first output was 11, if x was our first input, which is 0, <clears throat> then we have the next piece, so f of x minus 1. Now what this is saying here, if I'm trying to find the next input, this is just saying do the x minus 1 output, x minus 1 being the previous one, the one one higher on the list. So this is say to find the next one, take the previous one and add your delta term. So for us that was 3. Um, and we'll say if x is greater than 0. So on our table um, we had, uh, so the first line of that recursive rule sort of starts our function here. It says it's this if x is that, and then for all x is bigger than this, take the previous output and add delta. So 14 plus 3, 17 plus 3, 20 plus 3 to get the next one. So that's how that works. So a recursive rule <clears throat> for a linear um, function is just that. So it follows this general format, and it doesn't look friendly, um, but once you get used to using them, uh, they're pretty straightforward. Okay, so hopefully that is it for that. Uh, if you have any questions, comments, points of clarification, uh, you can post them in the comments below. Thanks for watching.